So today we're just going to introduce the topic of ANOVA. So this is one-way analysis of variance. And the reason you use ANOVA is if you want to compare population means across more than two populations. So we learned our 1 and Z, or our Z and T test for one sample. We learned how to do it for two samples. Now we'll do it for if you have more than two samples. So say you want to compare the mean mileage of four brands of tires or <clears throat> the mean weight loss of five different diets. Now, I do know that this says one-way analysis of variance, and we use it to look at the means. And we'll talk about why it's called analysis of variance in a little bit. Okay, so if we want to compare our mileage of multiple, or our means of multiple populations, then we'll take a sample from each population. And the null hypothesis is that all of the means are equal. So mu1 equals mu2 all the way up to mu k. And that means that the population means are all equal. Now let's take a side note and talk about what the opposite of that would be because people often make this mistake. Okay, so our null hypothesis is that mu1 equals mu2, let's say we have four populations, mu3 equals mu4. So if the null hypothesis is false, what are our options? Okay, so to make that false, what has to happen to make that false? So right now they're all equal. So we will know that not all of them are equal. So one option would be not all the means are equal. Okay. But people often make a mistake on what that means because they change the order of the words just a little bit and it makes a big difference. Because one of the options could be that all the means are not equal. Okay. Notice just the slight difference of what I did to the words there. So all the means not equal, that could be mu1, not equal to mu2, not equal to mu3, not equal to mu4. Okay, that would definitely make our null hypothesis false because they would not be equal. However, you don't have to have all of them be not equal to make your null hypothesis be false. You could just have mu1 be different from the rest. So mu2 could still equal mu3, could still equal mu4, and then you could just have mu1 be different. So that's just one different. Okay, or you could have like mu1 maybe be equal to mu2, and mu3 be equal to mu4, but not have the two sets equal. So that could be like two or more different, okay, or however you want to look at it. Okay, or you could have like mu1 equals to mu3, not equal to mu2, not equal to mu4, etc. So notice how there's a lot of different ways to make not all your population means equal. And that's why we prefer to say that at least one mean is different from the others. So coming back up to look at this, we prefer to say that at least one population mean is not equal to the others. Okay. Or you could say that not all of the means are equal, but a lot of people change the order of that wording and then it's not true anymore. So all we know for sure is that at least one population mean is different from the others. We don't know which one is different. We don't know how many are different. Just that at least one is different from the others. Okay. Our next topic is remember that there's variability in samples that we take from populations. So if I take this sample, I get a sample mean. If I take a different sample, I get a different sample mean. Okay. So when we consider these populations, even if all of our population means have populations have the exact same mean, you'd expect to see some difference in your sample means just due to your sampling variability. Okay. So what happens there is that the observed differences in your sample means that you see can be caused by two things. Your sampling variability, basically just which sample did you pick, okay, and then the difference in the population means. So you start out with different population means. So whether you started off with different population means, then your sample means would be really different, or you might just have some sampling variability, and then your sample means would only change a little bit, okay. or some combination of the two.
So our whole goal of ANOVA is we want to know if our observed differences in our sample means are due to just your chance sampling variability, just which sample did I pick, or if the differences are statistically significant, which would mean that they have different population means. Okay, one way to understand this to start with is to look at some box plots. Okay, so for A, here are four different samples with their box plots. Notice here I did add in the group mean as the diamond so you can see the actual mean for each box plot. Okay, so we can look at these means. So mean, 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 mean. Notice they're not all exactly the same, but they don't seem to change very much. In fact, it seems to be a very, very small change especially when you look at the standard deviation of each group. So we can't see the standard deviation exactly, but you can kind of judge the rough spread by looking at the box plot. And it looks like our data is fairly spread apart. And in fact, the data within each group seems to be spread apart further than the actual differences in the sample means. So what I think for A is I think that the variation between the groups seems bigger to me than the variation. So the variation within each group seems bigger to me than the variation between the groups, between those sample means. So I think for this situation that my population means were probably actually the same. Okay, now contrast that to part B. Okay, four different samples. Okay, notice these means change a lot and in fact the means change more than the actual values within each data set change. So here's my inner quartile range right here, just this box. And it's a pretty small box width. In fact, it's even smaller than the difference between my population means. And so what's happening here is I'm saying, okay, well, based on this data set, I don't think, or based on like this data set, I don't think it's possible that my population mean actually started here, equal with the others. I think that I must have actually started with different population means. So because the variation between the groups seems big when compared to the variation within each group, I think that the population means were probably different to start with. Okay, so that's just kind of an intuitive grasp. Let's make it a little more formal. So what we want to do is we, for ANOVA is we want to compare the variation between the groups and the variation within the groups. And this is why it's called analysis of variance, even though we're looking at means. So we have three overall sources of variation to consider in our data. So groups, also called treatments in our book, is the variation between your group means. So here's our groups. How much did we change between the groups? Then you have error, also called residual sometimes, which is the variation within the groups. So how much did my data vary within each group? So this group kind of varied a lot. This one, the values were a little bit closer, but we still had our long whiskers. Okay, so it's the variation within the groups versus the groups is variation between the groups. How much did the groups differ from each other? And finally, you have total variation in the data, which is just if you threw everything in one data set, how much did it vary? Okay, so why did Lucy have a different weight than Sally, etc.? Okay, so just all the total variation. And there's a few different ways that we can measure this. So one of the ways we measure is with sum of squares. So sum of squares is the sum of squared deviations, and this is how much your data deviates from the predicted values or means. So sum squares t, that sum squares total, okay, and that measures variation of the data around the overall mean. So if this image makes it easier to actually visualize this. So it's a dot for each data value instead of a box plot. Notice this dashed line is the overall mean. The overall mean is if you threw all your data into one data set and took the mean. That's the overall mean. So, <coughs> so for our sum squares total, we take each data point. So here's a data point minus the overall mean. Find the distance and square it. Why do we square them? Because otherwise, when we added up the values above and below, they'd all add up to zero. So we find that distance and square it. Then you'd also take, say, this point, find its distance to the mean, square it. This point, distance to the mean squared. This point, distance to the mean squared, etc. So you're measuring the distance, basically the variation of every single point to the overall mean, and that's your total variation. Then you have some squares group, or also in your book called treatment. So for that, it's the variation of the group means around the overall mean. Now group means on here, notice this little faint blue line, that's your group mean. 
Okay, so for the sum squares group, you take each group mean minus the overall mean, square it. This group mean minus the overall mean, square it. This group mean minus the overall mean, square it, and add them up. Sum squares error is the variation of each observation around its group mean. So this observation minus the mean, this observation minus the mean, this observation minus the mean, this one minus the mean, etc. Square them and add them all up. And you'll do that for each group and add it all up together. Okay. Now, interestingly, not something I'm going to make you memorize, but we did figure out that the sum squares total is equal to the sum squares group plus the sum squares of error, which is pretty cool. Then we have what's called degrees of freedom. So n is our total sample size and k is our number of groups. So our sum squares total, so we have total, group, and error. So our sum squares total has degrees of freedom of n minus 1. Okay. Our sum squares group has degrees of freedom of k minus 1 and our sum squares error has degrees of freedom of n minus k. Also, if you add up degrees of freedom for group and error, you will get total degrees of freedom. Again, kind of cool. Then you have mean square. So this is a measure of our variation that's scaled based on our sample sizes and number of groups. Because when you think about it, if I have thousands of observations up here and I minus each of them from the mean and square them and add them all up, the more observations I have, the bigger and bigger the sum of squares will get. And it might not necessarily be that my values are far from my mean, it just means that I have lots of them. And so somehow we need to scale it based on our sample size. So the way that we scale it is we base it on our sample size and our number of groups to scale it. And we call that mean square. So the mean square is always equal to the sum of squares divided by its degrees of freedom. So the mean square total is sum squares total over degrees of freedom for the total. Mean squares group is equal to sum squares group over degrees of freedom for the group. And mean square error is equal to the sum of squares for the error over degrees of freedom for the error. Okay. Finally, our test statistics. So somehow we wanted to compare, remember, the variation between the groups over the variation within the group. Somehow we wanted to compare that ratio. We're going to do it with our F test statistic. And the way that we do that is we do mean square group over mean square error. And that will measure our variation between the groups and the variation within the groups. Okay, and so that's how we measure it, and for our next section, we will talk about how we actually do that a little more quantitatively to see if that's a big or small ratio.